We're going to be in both of those. And it's a new year, and what I want to do is I want to kind of give us a, a vision for our church for this year. And to do that, very simply, this morning I'm going to start with these two short passages of Scripture. One of them is called the Great Commandment. The other one we call the Great Commission. If you want to sum up everything that the church, everything that Christians are to be about, what, how we're to live our lives, we can sum it up with these two passages. So we're going to look at both of those passages. And then what I'm going to do after we look at those passages, I'm going to give you five words that will tell us how we're to carry out those things. How we're to, to fulfill the Great Commandment. How we're to, to, to carry out the Great Commission. We're, we're going to look at five words and how we're to do that. But then after that, I'm going to spend the next four weeks guiding you in how, how each one of you as individuals and how we as a church carry out those things today in, in, in our culture, in the world we live in. So, so two passages, five words, four weeks. So uh, let, let's begin with the two passages. Uh, the first one is, is Matthew chapter 22. We call that the Great Commandment. Jesus was asked, Lord, what is the greatest commandment? And here's what he said, starting with verse 37. Jesus answered him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. All of Moses' teachings and the prophets depend on these two commandments. So when asked, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. In other places, it says he added all your strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the second passage I want to look at is the Great Commission. As Jesus was, was ready to ascend to heaven, this is kind of the last thing he said to his disciples, telling them, this is what you're to do after I leave. And we find that in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Let's read those together. Verse 19 says, so wherever you go, make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to do everything I have commanded you, and remember that I am always with you until the end of time. Now, as we look at that, that's the great commandment God gave to us people. This is what you must do, he said. This is the commission he gave to his followers and says, this is what you're going to do basically until I return. So, that, but that was 2,000 years ago. So when we think about it, you know, 2,000 years ago so, uh, that Jesus said those words, 2,000 years ago that he gave that commission. So I want to ask you this morning, 2,000 years later, in the year 2023, are we still supposed to go and make disciples? <coughs> yes, Absolutely. 2,000 some odd years later, are we still to love God and love each other as the most important thing? Yes. Absolutely. So here's the thing we see. Those have never changed. The Great Commandment is still the Great Commandment. The Great Commission is still the Great Commission. But we have to ask, how are we to do that? How does God intend for the church to carry out those things? So that's where our five words come in. I want to look at how the church fulfills the great commandment and keeps the great commission. Let me give you five words. Word number one, through worship. Worship is number one. Here's what the Bible said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And as I said, let me see all, and all your strength. And what that's telling us is love God with everything we have. All of our being is to be about loving God. But folks, that's what worship is. Worship is no more than our expression of our love for God. Whether it's through our singing, whether it's through our praying, whether it's through our preaching, whether it's through our gathering, our worship is nothing more than our expression of love for God. When we gather together corporately, like we have this morning, we come together as a group. We come together to, to as, as one body, Declare our love for God. That's what worship is. But unfortunately, over time, folks have tried to add things to that. We've taken worship away from, from just loving God to as a combination of loving God and loving self. And that's where we've made a mistake. When we've tried to put loving God 
And loving ourselves, we call that worship. Here's what I mean. We, 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 we love God. We want to express our love for God, but we better do it the way I like to do it. We better sing the songs I like to sing. The preacher better preach on my favorite passages, and I better sit around my favorite people. If not, I, I'm not worshiping God. See the problem? What we've done is we've tried to take the, the simple fact of worship is loving God. And over time, we've tried to mix in ourselves with that. We've tried to make ourselves so important that our worship has to be about us. Well, I didn't get anything out of it. Worship isn't getting anything. It's giving. It's expressing our love to God. Worship is how we love God. It's loving God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. How does the church carry out that great commandment? It starts with worship. But there's a second aspect of that. Jesus also said, and love your neighbor as yourself. So the second word I want to give you this morning is ministry. Ministry is the way we express our love for God toward other people. Now I want you to notice something. I told you to keep your Bibles open. I want you to look again back at that passage in Matthew 22. I want you to see something we often miss. Jesus said the, the first two greatest commandments is love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And that's the first and that's the greatest. But then he says this, and we miss this. He says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. We miss that phrase. We go to the love your neighbor part. We miss that where he says, the second is like it. Here's what that's telling us. That's telling us that we can't do one without the other. That's telling us that, that loving our neighbor is just as important as our love for God. So we can say, oh, I love God, but I don't love this person. The, then we're not really loving God. If we say we love our neighbor, but we're not, we don't love God, then, then we can't do that. The second is like it. Ministry is how we express our love for God through service to one another. And it's, it's service to all people. When we think about ministry, Jesus taught us a very important lesson. He, he taught us in a parable known as the parable of the Good Samaritan. The, the Jews had this idea that, that they were to be good to one another. If you were a fellow Jew and you, you followed the law wholeheartedly, then we could be good to you. But we didn't have to be good to anybody else. But, but Jesus told us a story. And you probably remember the story. Uh, somebody was going along the road and robbers came and beat him up and kind of left him for dead in the ditch and took all they had. And, uh, along came a priest. And, and, and the priest kind of took a look and went by on the other side of the road. The, the priest would have been a Jewish leaper. And uh, then along came a uh, Levite. And, and here's my, and the, uh, or, uh, a scholar. And as we look at it, it, it was a scholar that came... A scholar that came and uh, somebody that would study the law knew exactly what God's word said. And when that scholar came along, the scholar walked by on the other side of the road. But, but then the Bible says a Samaritan come by. Now, Samaritan was somebody that the Jews hated. They were kind of like half-breed Jews, if you want to call them that. Uh, but, but they hated them. They would go out of their way, just not have to go through Samaria. they call them dogs. They wouldn't have anything to do with them. And Jesus said, but the Samaritan stopped and helped him. He says, so who is your neighbor? And what Jesus taught us there is that everybody is our neighbor. It doesn't matter if they fit in our social status. It doesn't matter if they fit in our little clique. They don't, it doesn't matter if they're like us or if they're not. Jesus taught us that everybody is our neighbor. So when he says, love your neighbor as yourself, ministry is ministering to those who may be like you, but also who may not be like you. So the church fulfills the great commandment through worship and through ministry. But I want to give you another word this morning. One, one is just as equally important. And that word is evangelism. Now, <coughs> <coughs> Evangelism is kind of a big word, and evangelism is nothing more than, than telling the good news. It is telling others about Jesus. The Great Commission teaches us, wherever you go, make disciples of all nations. 
wherever you go. So, so kind of as you're going, if you're going to work, make disciples of all nations. If you're going to the store, make disciples of all nations. If you're traveling somewhere, make disciples. That's what it tells us to do. That's evangelism. And evangelism is nothing more than, than telling our story. A disciple is someone who follows. That, that's what all disciple is. A disciple of Jesus would be someone who follows the teachings of Jesus. So when he says go and make disciples, since we're talking about Jesus, our job is to go and, and, and make disciples or help others to learn to follow Jesus. Jesus kind of clears that up in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, uh, it, he gives us a, a little better picture of that great commission. And here's what it says in Acts 1 8. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you. Then you will be my witnesses to testify about me in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, now that's very simple, but Jesus gives answers four specific questions with that verse. First of all, he, he answers the question of who. He says, you will receive power when the Spirit comes to you. Then you will be my witnesses. And he's teaching us there that the who is us. We are the ones who are to be his witnesses. The what, the second question, is my witnesses. That what we're supposed to be, if it's about us, then we're to be his witnesses. A witness is just someone who tells what they've seen, what they've heard, and what they've experienced. That's all a witness is. They tell what they've seen, what they've heard, and what they've experienced. Well, we just went through Christmas, and we're familiar with the Christmas story. Remember the shepherds? And they were out in the field with their flocks, and the angels came to them and told them that Jesus was born. And then the heavenly host was praising God. And, and they said, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened. When they got to, to Bethlehem, when they got to where Jesus was, remember what they said? The Bible says they told everything that had happened to them. That's all God asks us to do. He asks us to tell the world what's happened to us. So if you think about it, the salvation message is, this is what I used to be. This is my life-changing experience because of Jesus. And this is what I am now. That's what's happened to us. When he tells us to evangelize, to go and make disciples, we're just to tell our story. What we've seen, what we've heard, and what we've experienced. That's how we carry out the first part of that Great Commission. So we have the who, we have the what. The third question that it answers there is the where. And, and that's why it says, to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to all the world. What's that telling us is, is we go everywhere. For the Jew, Jerusalem was where they lived. Judea was kind of the, the region. If we were to put it into a perspective, we understand, we can look at it this way. Jerusalem is Old Fields, or maybe even Hardy County. Judea would be the state of West Virginia. Samaria would be the United States, our nation. And, and, and the ends of the world would be the entire world. So he's telling them, you will be my witnesses here, a little further out, even further out, until you cover the whole world. So as we're going, no matter where we go, the where is everywhere we go, we're to be a witness of Jesus. We have the who, the what, the where. The last one is the how. And that verse tells us the, the how, and the how is through the power of the Holy Spirit. I hear folks all the time that tell me, oh, I couldn't be a witness to anybody. You know what? None of us can. The answer is, not a single one of us can be the witness God wants us to be. So he gave us a helper. Jesus says, I'm going so the helper can come. And the helper can, gives us the words to say. Gives us the ability to do it. You would be surprised if you just try it. How your mouth just opens and the words just come out. To tell your story. As a church, to carry out that great commission. As individuals, to carry out that great commission, we must evangelize. And evangelism is wherever you go, make disciples of all nations. So we have worship, ministry, evangelism, 
The fourth word I want to give you this morning is fellowship. We find that in the Great Commission as well. Fellowship, Jesus said, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So, so he's teaching us that, that, that not only do we go to that and make disciples, we're, we're to baptize them as well. Now, baptism has two purposes. Purpose number one, when we talked about this a few weeks ago, it provides a picture of our salvation. It provides a picture of us dying to sin with Jesus, being that sin being buried, and then raised to a new life for all eternity. That's the picture that baptism gives. So when we look at it, we, baptism gives us that picture of our salvation. But there's a second purpose of baptism. And the second purpose is baptism identifies us as being part of the group. For those early Christians, Baptism not only showed a picture of their salvation, it identified them so folks would know they belonged to Christ. They were followers of Jesus. Often we, we, we baptize folks to identify them with the body of believers. That they're baptized in the membership of Oldfield's Baptist Church. It identifies us as part of the group. It identifies them as Christians. The church is nothing more than the family of God. As believers, we are part of his family. And it's important for every believer to identify themselves as part of the group. The church today must be the family that God wants them to be. The church today must become that family. That's what fellowship is. Fellowship is being together with the only thing that joins us. And the only thing that joins us is Jesus. I mean, if you look around, you will instantly see folks who are not like you. They don't do the same things you do. They don't have the same interests you have. You know, there are so many different things about each one of us, but there's one thing that every born-again believer has in common. That's Jesus. That, that's that tie that binds. When we gather together with fellowship, just because we're part of the family, that joins us together. So when we're filling the Great Commandment, we're filling the Great Commission of worship, ministry, evangelism, fellowship. Number five, discipleship. Jesus said this, teach them to do everything I have commanded you. The discipleship is helping believers grow in maturity. It's helping them grow from, from a newborn Christian or a new, a new birth in Christ to become a, a mature believer. But I can tell you, this is a step that many churches leave out. As churches, we might be great at telling people the story of the good news, what's happened to us. We might see them saved. We might even be great at baptism. But for many churches, right there is where we hang people out to dry. We'll see them say, we, we can even count their number on our register because we baptized them. They're a member of our church, but we do nothing else to help them grow. It's important for every believer to be a part of the growing process. I want to tell you something I found. I found that there are people who know way more about the Bible than me. So from them, I can learn. There are folks who need me to help them because I might know more about the Christian life than they do. So all of us need to always be part of the growing process. I've met many pastors who think they're the pastor, so everybody just has to listen to them and, and they can't grow unless it comes from them. It didn't take me long to figure out that's not the case. I can tell you, many of you have been in the Bible many more years than I have. You know a whole lot more than I do. So I can learn from you. Discipleship is helping one another grow in Jesus Christ. Sometimes it might be through our learning. Sometimes it might be through our mentorship of someone else. How does the church carry out the Great Commandment and the Great Commission? Through worship, ministry. Evangelism, fellowship, discipleship. These five words 
describe everything that the church is to be about. A commandment that's never changed. A commission that still continues on. But here's where it gets tough. In order for the Christian to grow, they have to be, or for the church to grow, all five functions must be present. And all five functions are equally important. We already saw that, that we can't have worship without ministry. Jesus said in the seconds like it. So, so you can't have one without the other. You can't say, I love God, but I don't love people. They, 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 they have to go together. We have to have each one. And in our lives, each one is equally important. You can't have evangelism without discipleship. If not, you're seeing folks saying it and you're leaving them all as baby Christians. I can tell you, I've been in churches that are full of baby Christians. Some became a baby 50 years ago, some became a baby last week, but they're all still babies because there's no discipleship. You have to have each one in your life. We can't grow in Christ as disciples if we don't have fellowship. If we're not together as part of the group. We can claim we love God, but do we really love God if we're not an active part of, the, of our church? Where it gets tough is we can look at those and go, oh yeah, that's important. I have to have worship. I have to have evangelism. I have to have discipleship. There has to be And that's all important. But then the tough part is seeing, do we have each one equally in our lives? All five are equally important. That's how we fulfill the Great Commandment. That's how we fill the Great Commission. The Great Commandment will always be the Great Commandment. The Great Commission will always be the Great Commission. That is what Jesus set for his followers. That is what Jesus set for the church. These things never change. If the world continues for another 2,000 years, and the, the word of God is still preached. There will be preachers saying, this is the great commandment. This is the great commission. They never change. But, often the method in which we distribute them must change. The way we carry out those five sometimes have to change. Why? Because we live in changing times. Our culture is always changing. The, the way we learn, our learning process, is constantly changing. So we have to be willing. The commandment never changes. The commission never changes. But sometimes the way we package it, the way, the way we distribute it, the way we teach others, sometimes that has to be a little different. Let me show you what I mean. I want to show you things that has changed in the church in most of our lifetimes. Now, I'm not talking about you know, the change from, from back in the 1800s when the church used to do Gorgonian chants for their music. I hope we never go back to that. Honestly, I, I, I'd rather do about anything than I, I hope that never comes around again. But Things that have changed in the church just in most of our lives. How many folks this morning are 20 years old or older? I want to give you some things. How many of you are 10 years old or older? Those of you who raised your hand the first time, you're going to hit the second time. <laughs> just, just so you know. I want to give you things that have changed in the church in that period of time. I, I want us to go back 20 years to the year 2003. And that, let's think about, in January of 2003, what has changed since then? Well, one of the first things that probably came to your mind is technology. Technology has definitely changed. Or we might say it's changed a little bit since 2003. I decided to do a little research on the change of technology in the last 20 years. 20 years ago, you would still be waiting another three and a half years for your first Android phone. A few months after that, we know it would be copied and the iPhone would be back. 
And, and, and then they would continue, each one would try to outdo each other and, and until today we have the, the uh, Android 600 and the iPhone 602 or whatever we're up to now. <laughs> but 20 years ago, we didn't even have those things. 20 years ago, if you had the state-of-the-art home computer on your, in your home, it would have 5 gigabytes of memory, max. And when you played games on your home computer, the number one game that you played 20 years ago was Minesweeper. That was the most popular brand new game in 2003. So you go, I played Minesweeper. I'm going to have some answers here because I dominated the Minesweeper. That's what we had 20 years ago. Some of our kids are going, what in the world's Minesweeper? <laughs> That's how much technology has changed. 20 years ago, Google would be celebrating its fifth birthday. And, and the nation would celebrate because we now had a new connection to where if we had the ability, we could Google faster. And that new connection 20 years ago was called Ethernet. <laughs> Ethernet came out 20 years ago. And if you're waiting on Facebook, you're going to have to wait at least another year before anyone would even mention Facebook. 20 years ago, if someone wanted to determine if there was a church in Oldfields that they could attend, do you know how they would do it? The yellow pages of the phone book. Some of our kids would go, what's a phone book? <laughs> 20 years ago, that's what we would have done. You wouldn't go to Google if, you know, churches in Oldfields, West Virginia. You'd go to, the, or the newspaper. Every church took out an ad in the newspaper 20 years ago because that's how folks would find their church. 20 years ago, if someone wanted to experience church for themselves, they would have to get in their car and travel to that building and go to that church. Something that has changed in the church in our lifetime drastically has been technology. So when we look at how we present the Great Commandment, how we fulfill the Great Commission, we have to look at how do we use the changes of technology. Because, let's face it, nobody wants to go back to dial-up. <laughs> the face of technology has changed. The church has to change with that. Now that one was pretty easy, but I want to give you some other things that maybe you haven't realized has changed in the church in 20 years. And the second word I want to give you is competition. The church has changed with competition. Now I'm not talking about one church trying to outdo the other church. We have that all the time. We'll probably have that until Jesus comes. You know, churches keep swapping members and saying they're growing. That, that's not what I'm talking about, even though that happens. I never really saw the, the a picture of competition until I looked at it through Vacation Bible School. And here's what I found in Vacation Bible School. 20 years ago, what did your kids have to do? What, what was there for them to do in the summer? Basically nothing. Go to the pool. You can't even say 20 years ago they spent the whole summer playing Little League Sports. When I was a kid, Little League ended at the end of school. And so, you, so 20 years ago, what parents would do to have something for their kids to do, to be with other kids, is they would take them to vacation Bible school. And, and churches, kids would do the Bible school circuit. Churches would call each other to see what week their Bible school was scheduled so you didn't schedule the same week. So that you could get the kids from the Baptist church at the Methodist church, and from the Methodist church at the Presbyterian church, because the only thing for the kids to do was go to vacation Bible school. So, so that was not a problem. But look today. Look at how many choices our kids have for doing something in the summer. So churches now have to compete. We can't just put a banner in the yard that says vacation Bible school this week and the kids are all going to come running. We have to advertise, we have to promote, we have to do all kinds of things because we are now in competition in Bible school with all the other stuff that, that our kids can do. And, and 
and we're given the choice to tell the kids, you can do this, 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 or this, or you can go down to the church for three hours and listen to them tell you about Jesus. Most churches does not want to choose that latter option, or most people are not going to choose that latter option. So it's a competition. When I realized that about vacation Bible school, all of a sudden the challenge for churches became clear. Folks, the church today, in 2023, has a lot of competition. There are so many things that, that uh, can take folks away on a Sunday. So many things that people decide to be involved in. So one of the major changes, unlike 20 years ago, today the church has to compete with everything else that the world has to offer on a Sunday. So something we've seen change drastically in our lifetime is competition for the churches. A third thing that we've seen change drastically in 20 years in our church is socialization. So, so my third thing, third thing is, is socialization has changed. 20 years ago, people came to church just to be with other people. Because if you think about it, what were lifestyles more like 20 years ago? You went to school or you went to work, wherever you went there, and then you came home. 20 years ago, that was the biggest part of most folks' lives. Go to school or work, come home. So to be around other people than those that go to school or work, people would go to church. Because that was their way of being together. Now, look how that's changed today. I can tell you, there are nights that my family don't eat supper till 9, 9 30, 10 o'clock. Now, some of you go, well, I couldn't do that. And the reason is, when we leave school or work, we got this to do and that to do and this place to go and that place to go and all these things. So we're seeing all these people. The need for the church is our socialization is no longer there because we're always around people. So we've seen that drastic change. Uh, another thing that, that has changed about our socialization is our electronic devices. Now because of electronic devices, whatever you have in your hand, we don't have to physically be together to still socialize. I can tell you, we have seen this in our teenagers. <clears throat> and I don't have to go back 20 years, I can go back maybe 10 years or less to see the change the electronic devices has provided in socialization in our teenagers. 10 years ago, in our church, we would have 20 teenagers here for whatever was going on. We'd have work day and 20 teenagers would show up just so they could be together. They, they would come in, and, and now I learned real quick, you had to put them like in groups to do something. Don't give them each a job, it never got done. Because the reason they were here was they liked being together. So we had that socialization aspect. Now today in 2023, I can tell you, teens know more about each other from, from Snapchat than they do from being physically together. They can tell you more about each other, so the socialization is more. You ever watch them? You know, they're, 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 they're all the time sending messages back and forth, sending pictures, sending... They know everything that's going on in everybody's life. So one of the things that the church now has facing, and we see it in our teens, I'm not, I'm not just picking on the teens, I see it in our adults too. Let me ask you this, adults. How many of you would rather communicate through a text message than a phone call? Why? Because that's become our socialization. Now, so I know there, there's probably somebody here going to watch a text message. We'll, we'll get to you in a couple weeks. But, but here's the thing. One of the things that we're finding in churches is a change in socialization. I have a video that I took nine years ago. And it was of the school bus stopping on a Wednesday night at Oldfield's Baptist Church. And I stood right out here on this porch, and I had 21 kids getting off the bus to come here on Wednesday. Why? Because they needed to be together. That, that was their social thing. We don't have that anymore. Because we don't need that. So, so where socialization used to be the thing that brought people to church, 
It's no longer there. Through the changes in our culture, we no longer need the church for socialization. So therefore, folks aren't coming to church for it. That's been a major change in the church. Now let me, let me give you a fourth one. I didn't know what to call this thing. Here's what I call it. All welcome. I didn't have one word for it, so I call it all welcome. Here's what I mean. 20 years ago, people would look for a church. 20 years ago, uh, today, very seldom, we have, very seldom we have folks that say, we've been looking for a church, and, and, and we, you know, I, every once in a while I get that, and, and God bless you if that's you. But today, people aren't looking for a church. 20 years ago, all, every church had on their sign, all welcome. That's why I chose that. 20 years ago, we had an ad in the Moorfield paper that said, Oldfield's Baptist Church, here's our service time, everyone welcome. And folks would see that and they would know, hey, I can go to that church. But today, people aren't looking for a church. Today, people aren't searching to find that church. Because there's so many other things in our life that provide all the things that maybe we were trying to find in a church. So folks aren't looking for the church. And I'll tell you, it took me a long time to understand that. Because I've actually been seeing this for, for, for many years and didn't understand it until I put this together. For several years, the thing that puzzled me, just I, I could never figure this out. How come folks from here didn't know there was a church in Oldfields? And you're all going, what? But, but I've had folks, maybe they called for food or, or some other ministry or, or something, and they would say, you know, uh, you know, I'd tell them, meet me at the church. Where's your church located? Now, to me, that's just kind of like a dumb question. I know we're not supposed to call any question dumb, but I'd say old fields. I mean, just think about it. I can stand at this corner of the yard and I can see both signs. You know, oh, but how big is it? What else is here? And, and folks would say, is it near the store? Our building's four times the size of that store. And if I have to say, a whole lot neater. <laughs> Looks a whole lot better. Got a great big white thing sticking at the top with a cross that says, hey, I'm a church. <laughs> we call a steeple. And folks would say, is it near the store? And, and I, I would get off the phone just scratching my head thinking, how in the world? And, you know, I had a person from Tanglewood. If you don't know where Tanglewood is, it's right up here at the top of the hill who called me for food one time and says, now where's your church located? I said, Oldfields. Well, I live in Oldfields. Where is it? <laughs> so, you know, I had to figure this out at this time. So I said, four miles north of the Walmart. <laughs> Anybody want to take a guess what they did? <laughs> Drove from Tanglewood to Walmart and clocked four miles back and got a box of food. <laughs> True story. But finally, I, 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 I finally tell, sometimes my wheels turn a little slow. I finally figured out. They're looking for gas. People today are looking for beer. They're looking for cigarettes. They're looking for ice cream. They're looking for biscuits and gravy in the morning. But people aren't looking for church. So folks, our day of putting all welcome on the sign... It's no more. That's a major change that we have seen in the church just in our lifetimes. Our commandment is still the same. The commission has never changed. But our culture is changing rapidly. I call this lesson in my notes the challenge. Because the challenge is, what's a church to do? We're to love God with all of our heart and soul and mind. We're to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're to go and make disciples. We're to baptize them in the fellowship of the church. Or we're to teach them the things that Jesus taught us to do. So what's the church to do? We know what Scripture tells us. But in a changing culture, how do we successfully do these things? I can promise you, 
There are folks, and it may even be some of you sitting here today, who think the church needs to stay exactly as it was in the 1930s. There are folks like that. We should do everything. The church should look the same. We should act the same. We should do the same thing as we do in the 1930s. And you know what? When it comes to teaching the work, we should. But sometimes how we deliver that word has to change. We hear different. We understand differently. The, the challenge is how do we as a church successfully carry out the Great Commandment, fulfill the Great Commission in such a changing culture? In the next three weeks, I want to lay out for you a vision for, for 2023 for Oldfield Baptist Church to help us to successfully do that. But before we go any further, I need to ask each one of you two very important questions. Question number one. In which area are you struggling to do what God has taught us to do? God's given, I gave you five words. You saw me take each one of those and describe them in Scripture. I didn't make this up. The first thing we have to determine, as a body of believers, or even as an individual in Christ, in what area am I struggling? Maybe today your struggles in worship, because you found yourself guilty of trying to bring the me in worship. And your worship isn't just an expression of your love for God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Maybe for you today it's ministry. You find that your struggle isn't loving God. You love God, but you're really struggling with loving people. Maybe today is evangelism. Maybe your struggle today is just telling your story, what you've seen, what you've heard, what you've experienced. Maybe your struggle is fellowship. I love God. I want to minister to people, but I ain't coming to church. I don't need to be a part of the body to do that. Or maybe today your struggles in discipleship. You say, wait a minute. If Pastor Dan were to measure my spiritual growth on that board, I don't think I've grown it in the last year or two. Here's what I want each of us to determine. In what area are we struggling to do these five things equally? That's our place to start. Now, as you determine that, let me take that question a little further. What is one thing that you can do differently starting today to make all five equal in your life? I don't want you to look at this five and go, oh, I'm all messed up, I'm just not going to go try. What's one thing that you can do starting today to make all five equal? I gave you a space in your program this morning to write that down. Because to me, that's that important. What area am I struggling? And what's one thing I can do to start today to bring them to equal? Because folks, we can talk about change all we want to talk about. We can talk about the Great Commandment and we can talk about the Great Commission uh, uh, until we've been here until supper time. But if we're not going to make a change in our life to do what God says to do, there's no reason to talk about it. So what's one thing you can do, not the person beside you, not the person that's not here today, what's one thing you can do to begin to make those five equal in your life. Once you determine that, and determine you're going to do that thing, then I have a second question for you. And my second question is this. Are you willing to be a part of a changing church presenting an unchanging word of God? 
Are you willing to be a part of a changing church? Folks, the church cannot be the 1930s still. But the Word of God never changes. Are you willing to be a part of a changing church? That may be, mean doing things a little differently. That may mean a different look. That may mean different ministries. We're going to talk about those in the weeks to come. But you have to say yes or no. Are you willing to be a part of a changing church presenting the unchanging Word of God? Now, as we pray this morning, I'm going to ask you to take your answers to those two questions and take them to God. I want you to start well with the person. Lord, this is an area I'm struggling with. And this is one thing I want to start today to help that struggle. Give, give that to God. Ask His help. Confess that to Him. And then make Him that promise. Lord, I will follow your command. I will do my part to fill your commission. Even if that means changing. But will never change the word of God. As I pray, will you take a moment and pray that prayer for yourself? Let, let, let's just pray there. Lord God, we see the orders. What we're to be and how we're to be it. But Lord, we also see some major changes that have happened just in our lifetimes. The changes, the way we carry that out. So Lord, today we look at that one thing that we need to do differently. And we bring that to you. We ask your guidance. We ask your help. And then Lord, we make that commitment. To follow your command and fulfill your commission. Even though that may bring some changes to our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us, please? It's missing.